we we worship God and we resolve to move when we understand that everything that we do in our lives we worship God anything that we do every second of our lives the very often we think that there is a separation that worship is what we do on a Sunday morning and once we have taken off our Sunday clothes put them in the closet that we live life outside of God. no every second of our lives we worship our readings today come firstly from Psalms uh, 95, 1 through 6. It says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. Let us extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Then Revelation 19, verse 1 through 10 says, After this, I heard what sounded like a roar of the great multitude of in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his serv servants, and again they shouted, Hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne and they cried amen hallelujah then a voice came from the throne saying praise our God all of you his servants you who fear him both great and small then I heard what sounded like a great multitude like the roar of a rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, linen bright and clean, was given her to wear. Here it says, fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. At this, I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. Amen. This is the word of God. Good morning. It's lovely to uh, be with you, to see you, um, to see all of you. And what, what a privilege it is to worship God together. And we, we also would love to welcome those who are worshiping with us online. Um, it's 
just an incredible connection that um, God enable us to enjoy as we worship him. We start today a, a three-part um, sermon series um, based on um, life through the eyes of God. You know, at the beginning of the year, it is always just um, a good time to realign um, the direction that we take in the year with what uh, God's aim and intention about our lives are. Ah. And, and so in the next uh, three weeks, we um, will try to pull um, three things together. Today, we look at the worship uh, that uh, honors God. And then next week, I would like to look at uh, what it means to become like Christ. And then um, towards the end of the month, I uh, would like to uh, look with you at our call as kingdom builders and what it means and what it entails. Let us pray. Father, we, we are grateful for the privilege of worship because worship, it's a huge privilege that you give to us. Thank you. And now may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Every day, all the day long, everywhere you go, you worship. It's what we do and it is who we are. A theologian, J.K. Chesterton, once said, when we cease to worship God, we do not worship nothing because we worship anything. Louis Giglio, in his book on worship says, and I just want to quote him, and it goes like this. Some of us attend the church on the corner professing to worship the living God above all. Others who really step inside the church doors would say worship is not a part of their lives because they are not religious. But everybody has an altar. And every altar has a throne. Should you for some reason choose not to give God what he, de what he deserves, you will worship something. Exchanging the creator for something he has created. We are all worshipers created to bring pleasure and glory to God. God who has created us. Max Lucado says, there is something that worship does to us. Worship adjusts us. It lowers the chin of the haughty and straightens the back of the burdened. It bows the knees, singing to him our praises. It opens our hearts 
offering to him our uniqueness. Worship properly positions the worshiper. And oh, how we need it. We walk through life as so bent out of shape, cure any flare up of commonness by setting your eyes on our uncommon king. Worship, lift our eyes and set them on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at the right hand in the place of honor and power. We worship God because we have to. We worship God because we need that worship. We worship God because God deserves our worship. God would die for your sin. And he will not let you die for your sin yourself. What do you do with such a savior? Except to lift your life up to worship him. That the gift that you give, your response to this gift is to respond with your life, a gift of worship. We have read the book of Revelation. Um, Ross read that beautifully for us. And there's something quite unique about the book of Revelation. It was written during the time of persecution. And the intention was that should anybody who was not the follower of the way pick up the pick up any material from the book of Revelation, they will not understand because it talks in numbers, it talks in images, it talks about symbolism that only people of the way, people who worship God will understand the meaning of of these symbols, of these numbers, of these images. And one of the powerful, um, for me, um, part that revelation play in the whole story of who we are, it's how it portrays worship and what worship is going to be like in the end. You know, if you are sitting in your life and you look at the world and you ask yourself, will the challenges, the trouble, the pain, the sadness that we see in the world, will they come to an end? Is there any time that God is going to be triumphant over forces of darkness and death? Is there going to be any time that God defeat forces of darkness that we see rampant in the world? And as we, as we read Revelation, and especially where we have read today, chapter 19 of Revelation, it, it is a huge comfort because we know that in the end, the God is going to defeat forces of darkness. And here, if you have to understand Revelation 19, you have to read it together with 18. Because in, in chapter 18, he talks about the, the great Babylon and the prostitute and, and the adultery that has surrounded the whole life and the meaning of the great Babylon. You know, it is, it is the air, it is the world, 
It is the sin that we see in the world. It is the pain. It is the sadness that Babylon had come to represent. It is the sickness. It is the pain. It thinks when we when we look at the world and we ask ourselves, will things ever work and reflect the glory of God? And so John is he um, is sitting in the island of, of Patmos and has seen incredible revelation and God opening things and allowing him to see, he come to the realization that the great Babylon is going to be defeated. And that one day God will deal away with the prostitute Babylon. That God is going to deal away with all the adultery that he has caused. And God will deal away with how he has misled his people. And revelation help us to understand the mode of worship. We worship God because of his creative works. When we look at the world, the world is filled with wonder of things that God has put in place. It reflects the glory and the might of God. We worship because we respond to the redemptive activity of God. We remind ourselves that we have been bought with a great price. Our redemption, as God rescue us from sin and buy us back and bring us back into the fold, it cost the life of his son. Blood was shed at Calvary, so that we can stand as people who have been rescued, people who have been brought back home. We worship because God is a righteous judge. We, we praise him, we worship him for his righteous judgment. We know that he will treat us justly and righteously. And when we, when we remember that we have been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that God has made an incredible preparation for us to stand before him, Paul, as he writes to the Romans in chapter 8, starts that chapter with just words that are comforting and encouraging, encouraging. That now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we remember then, we come to the realization that because of Jesus Christ, because how our lives, God has allowed our lives to merge with the life of Jesus, we will stand before him, standing in the power of Christ in the name of Jesus Christ. And then his promise apply that for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. We worship because We are, and we will always remain the bride of Christ. 
and our invitation to the wedding of the Lamb will forever be an open invitation that God continuously draw us into this fellowship, into this relationship. And how do, we, how do we express our worship? How do we give over to God? We do so by the book of Revelation help us. Chapter 19 helps us. Um, he, he, John here uses the word hallelujah, praise the Lord four times, just helping us to understand the emphasis as we approach the throne that our lives our call is always a life that God wants us to praise him and to praise his name to glorify him to give thanks to him and we do that by song as well And the worship team has led us so beautifully in song, in coming before the throne of God to worship him. As we allow the words to sink deep into our souls and remind us of who God is. Our prayers, as we open them to God, opening us the word of God as it speaks to us. I always um, like to remind you that you don't read the Bible. The Bible read you. So when you when you open the word of God, the Bible should read you, not you reading the Bible. Our worship is expressed as we offer our gifts. We become aware that whatever I have. Whatever I have gained in this life, whatever I have in, in my pockets, has first been given to me by God. You know, you have hands, you can think, you can do things. It's not, it's not that you have done anything that put you in a better place than someone who does not have hands, who does not have, you, you come across, you see people without limbs, people who can do things, people who cannot even talk, people that are disabled in some way or the other. And not that it is deliberate action of God, but you, you realize that whatever you have is a gift of God. And you don't deserve that. It's a purely a gift of grace. Revelation is, is so helpful in terms of helping us to tune and to prepare for worship. You know, it helps us to respond to God. It, it introduces us to um, how worship in the eyes of God 
is a sacred activity because we come into his presence and God moves into our death. Tembaro has spoken and written about the transcendence of God and the immanence of God. And in the transcendence of God, help us to look at God as high and lifted up, glorious, majestic, God as King of Kings, God as Lord of Lords, as well as the God who is immanent. The God who, who come closer to us. John and Eugene Peterson had said in his tr translation of John 1, when we talk about the word become flesh, God dwelling among his people, he says that God has tabernacled with us. He has set his throne in our midst. So he is present with us. So when we, when we look at this, God in his might, in his holiness, but God who also mingles and dwells with us. What do you do? How how do you respond to this God? And I thought that maybe not to list so many things that we need to do to respond to God. Because we need to understand that worship, worship is what God has made us for. We have been made to worship God. There is part of us that will always be restless. It will always be restless because it has to worship God. So when we push God out, then something comes in that we will worship. You know, worship is whatever is of value to us, we will bow down before that thing. Whatever pulls us, we will always bow down to that. Well, somebody said that the, we look at the tale of our lives. We look at where we spend the gifts of God. We look at life, we look at where our money goes. We look at how we spend our days, our week. If we have to point and write where we have spent at that time. We look at the things that we say and things that pull our attention. Maybe things that attract us that we are concerned about, books that we read. And it is said that 
quite quickly when you begin to do an assessment of those things, you will come to the conclusion of where or what will be the altar of your life. And as we said that at every altar, there is a throne and you will bow down to that throne. Whoever is on that throne, you will bow down to him. We, we worship God and we resolve to move when we understand that everything that we do in our lives, we worship God. Anything that we do, every second of our lives. The, very often we think that there is a separation, that worship is what we do on a Sunday morning. And once we have taken off our Sunday clothes, put them in the closet, that we live life outside of God. No. Every second of our lives, we worship. Everything that falls out of our mouths is a worship. Any action that we take, it's worship. The worship of God is, it's deeply, deeply part of our lives that we cannot even begin to pull and compartmentalize our lives in terms of worship and non-worship life. We worship God every second of our lives. So how do we do this? I, I have taken um, one of the powerful advice that I thought that Rick Warren offers on worship. That what we have to do, there's nothing that we can do except to surrender to God. We surrender our lives, we give God all of who we are. They say, it's Zulu hymn in the congregational hymn books that, that talks about it. Um, um, the songwriter asks, what can I give to God? How do I surrender to him? Except to give him all of who I am. Everything. My, my very being is given to worship him. Because when, when we surrender, Rick Warren will say that it is not a passive resignation of fatalism or an excuse for laziness. It is not accepting the status quo it may mean the exact opposite. Sacrificing your life or, suff or suffering in order to change what needs to be changed. God often calls surrendered people to do battle on his behalf. Surrendering is not for cowards or for dormants. Likewise, it does not mean giving up rational thinking. God would not waste the mind he gave to you. God does not want, does not want the robots to serve him. Surrendering is not repressing your personality. God wants to use your unique personality rather than 
it's being diminished. Surrendering enhances it. Paul help us to understand what it means to surrender. He says, when, when you come to the place in your life where you say, I have given my life to God. And I no longer leave. I have embraced what God has been doing in my life. I have allowed Christ to come into my life. So I no longer exist because my life has been given over to God. And I will live my life to bring glory and honor to him. And John in chapter 3 says that if we want to understand what surrender is, we have to decrease so that God can increase in our lives. We have to decrease so that God can increase in our lives. We are created for worship. And worship, it's one thing that we take with us beyond this life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he talks about love. And uh, you remember when he comes to the end, he talks about these three things. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of this is love. I have always understood that love and worship are the two things that we are going to take with us beyond this life when we come into glory. So, hallelujah, praising God once we have left this life is what we are going to do always, every, every second of our lives in the presence of God. We will worship him. We will give him glory. John Piper put it quite beautifully. He says, when this age is over and countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God. Missions will be no more. You know, sometimes we, we, we want to see the church in action. We want to see what the church is doing. We want to see how the church responds to poverty. He says, missions and the things that we do will be normal. Because they are a temporary necessity. But worship abides forever. The Bible says that one day all people will bow down to the Lord. And no matter how powerful 
someone might be or think that they are. One day, we will all lay our crowns at the feet of God. Because there is only one king in heaven. And he alone is worthy of all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Amen.